Good evening. Welcome to the David Stenbaugh Show. We're not going to look at Revelations chapter 7 tonight. We're going to do that probably on Thursday. Probably be Thursday evening sometime. I want to look at uh, Mark chapter 4 verses 35 through 41 tonight. On the same day, when evening, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him, and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? To cross over the Sea of Galilee, a lake only eight miles wide, would not seem difficult at first glance. Yes, its unique geography, yet its unique geography produces a greatly varying climate. The lake is situated 700 feet below sea level and is surrounded by mountains that rise three to four thousand feet above sea level on the west, north, and east. Tropical conditions prevail around the lake's surface where even bananas are grown today, yet the higher elevations can produce chilling night air. It's not unusual, even today, for a sudden great windstorm to appear on the Sea of Galilee during the evening hours. The warm tropical air from the lake's surface rises and meets the colder air from the nearby hills. The resulting turbulence stirs up great waves, which make boating extremely treacherous. The mention of Jesus being asleep on a pillow shows his true humanity. He was fully human and needed food and rest, just as all people do. Jesus' command over the wind and the sea demonstrates his full and complete deity. Only God, the Creator, can calm wind and sea. Mark uses the disciples' question, Who can this be? to evoke a similar response in the minds of his readers. Mark relates the works and words of the one he calls Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark chapter 4 verse 41 says, Who can In this major election address entitled, The United States Elevated to Glory and Honor before the Governor and the General Assembly of Connecticut in May 1783, stating, In our lowest and most dangerous state, in 1776 and 1777, we sustained ourselves against the British Army of 60,000 troops commanded by the ablest generals Britain could procure throughout Europe with a naval force of 22,000 seamen and above 80 men of war. Who but a Washington, inspired by heaven, could have conceived the surprise move upon the enemy at Princeton that Christmas Eve when Washington and his army crossed the Delaware? Who but the ruler of the winds could have, deploy, could have delayed the British reinforcements <coughs> excuse me, by three months of contrary ocean winds at a critical point of the war. Or what but a providential miracle at the last minute detected the treacherous scheme of traitor Benedict Arnold, which would have delivered the American army, including George Washington himself, into the hands of the enemy. On the French role in the revolution, it is God who so ordered the balancing interest of nations as to produce an irresistible motive in the European maritime powers to take our part. The United States are under peculiar obligations to become a holy people unto the Lord our God. 
Franklin, Del Rose, Franklin D. Roosevelt stated before the opening of World War II, before our nation's entry into World War II, he stated this. Once I prophesied that this generation of Americans had a rendezvous with destiny, that prophecy has come true. That was Franklin D. Roosevelt. At the close of his annual State of the Union message to Congress in January 1939, and with war about to break out in Europe, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt quoted Abraham Lincoln and said, Once I prophesied that this generation of Americans had a rendezvous with destiny, that prophecy comes true. To us, much is given, more is expected. This generation will nobly save or mainly lose the last best hope of earth. The way is plain, peaceful, generous, just, a way which if followed the world will forever applaud and God must forever bless. One wonders if Roosevelt realized just how true his words would become for the great generation of young Americans he addressed. By 1940, most of mainland Europe had fallen to Nazi aggression. With German troops controlling Paris, Stalin and the Communists in the East were rapidly building up one of history's largest ground armies to defend Russia. Japan had signed a 10-year military pact with Germany and Italy, forming an Axis power they were confident would eventually rule the world. With the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December, on December 7, 1941, Americans whose lives had been shaped by the trying times of the Great Dep Depression volunteered by the hundreds of thousands to fight the enemies abroad and to save the world from tyranny. The majority of the world's nations split into two opposing military alliances, the Allies and the Axis powers. Over 100 million military personnel would engage in the battle and over 60 million people, including about 20 million soldiers and 40 million civilians, were killed, making it the deadliest and most widespread war in history. By the D-Day invasion of Europe on June 6, 1944, 12 million Americans were in uniform and over 16 million Americans would eventually fight in the Second World War. War production had taken over the nation's industry, representing over 40% representing over of the gross national product. When the Battle of the Bulge was fought in December 1944, over 6.5 million women had been added to the nation's workforce since 1939. Valiant Marines planted the flag on Iwo Jima in February 1945, and on September 2nd, the Japanese signed the Surrender Agreement. Over 400,000 of America's heroic young people gave their final measure of devotion in this war. From overcoming the misery of long years of economic depression in the 1930s to defeating Nazism and Japanese imperialism to the Herculean task of remaking the post-war American society, this generation of Americans born for a rendezvous with destiny was undoubtedly the most influential of the 20th century. But what was it that made them a generation of patriots, heroes, and builders? Perhaps the answer was expressed to one of their own, Mitchell Page, a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor, the nation's most prestigious military honor, for his actions at the Battle of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands on October 26, 1942, after all the other Marines in his platoon were killed or wounded for hours, Page operated four machine guns, single-handedly stopping an entire Japanese regiment. Had that position fallen and the Japanese regained the airfield the Marines had taken, it is possible that the outcome of World War II may have significantly changed. In the years to come, Page was repeatedly asked why he would be willing to put his life on the line for his country. He said that the answers took him back to a Pennsylvania three-room country school where the children were so steeped in the traditions of America that they literally felt themselves a part of a glorious heritage, where the teacher opened the school day with the Bible verse and the Pledge of Allegiance, and where they memorized all the great documents that established the bedrock of America, such as the Gettysburg Address. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. His response went this way. 
my undying love of country, and my strong loyalty to the Marines fighting by my side gave me no choice but to fight on unswervingly throughout my battles, utilizing my God-given ability to make use of what I had been taught and learned. When Paige left home to walk the 200 miles to the nearest Marine recruiting station in 1936, his mother packed him a lunch in which she included the note, Trust in the Lord, son, and he will guide you, and he will guide you always. He said those words remained forever in his mind, and whenever fear would overtake him, he was comforted by them. Paige said, I will never forget sitting in a foxhole, bloody, burned, and injured the morning after all our all-night fierce hand-to-hand -hand battle against an overwhelming Japanese force on Guadalcanal. I was alone except for hundreds of dead bodies of the enemy surrounding me. I emptied my pack looking for something to stop the bleeding from a bayonet wound and out fell my small Bible. Picking it up in my dirty, bloody hands, I could scarcely believe it when providentially it opened at Proverbs 3 and there were my mother's words. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. Mitchell Page was a true servant and patriot of America, and America is proud to have had hundreds of thousands of valiant soldiers cut from the same cloth. Folks, keep our nation in prayer. Keep our nation's leaders in prayer. We must do this. And we must pray and seek a revival of this nation, a spiritual revival, that we once again come into God's good graces. The things that are happening around our country right now are the judgments of God. And this is but the beginnings of sorrows. Mark my words, if we do not repent as a nation, we are doomed, and we will fall into the dust of history, never to be heard from again. We must turn our spiritual lives around. We must turn the spiritual life and the moral life of this nation around once again to where we are a God-fearing and God-honoring country. This is a must-do. Failure here is not an option. If we want to be blessed by God once again, rather than to fall under his condemnation and judgment. God bless America again. And America, please, bless God once again. Here we go.